um, on behalf of my tag, I want to welcome everybody today to the popular primates talk with um, Southwick Zoo. We have Dr. Samantha Russick here. She's the director of education at Southwick Zoo, and she'll talk about the 18 um, species of primates that they do have, including some uh, mischievous monkeys and uh, lemurs and apes and all. Um, let us explore these uh, amazing animals today. And there'll be lots of uh, fun video clips as well. So, um, and just one other uh, housekeeping footnote, we do have um, uh, closed uh, auto captioning available for this talk as well under live transcript on the Zoom. So um, without further ado, I'm gonna have, um, Samantha, take us through as we explore some of the amazing primates at the Southwick Zoo. Uh, Samantha? All right, thank you so much. Um, really excited to be back for another one of these talks. Um, the primates here are one of my favorite groups of animals. I probably shouldn't say that. I love all the animals here, but I am a little biased towards our primate friends. Um, so I'm really happy to be sharing info about them today. Um, Today's presentation has a lot of information, so we're going to try and keep questions until the end. Um, but we have someone monitoring the chat box, and then uh, we'll have time for some questions at the end for sure. Um, so keep those in mind as I'm talking. If something sparks your interest, we can definitely go back and revisit that. Um, and with that, I'm going to start sharing, and hopefully this works. All right. Um, so as uh, Diane mentioned um, we have 18 species of primates here at Southwick Zoo, which is the largest primate collection in New England. Um, and across those 18 different species, we have 89 individuals at the moment. So um, some of these species we have in larger groups, um, some of them are smaller groups or maybe just pairs. And that really depends on the characteristics of the species, whether they're supposed to be social or not, um, and, and just kind of the social um, groupings that we have available uh, in our facility and across other facilities um, for the best interests of the animals. So um, before we get talking about the different kinds of primates that we have, it's probably useful or helpful to know what is a primate. Um, so primates are an order um, in the animal kingdom. And what makes a primate a primate or part of this group um, are a couple different features. The main ones are that they have forward facing eyes. So eyes on the front of their faces versus the sides with binocular vision. Um, so that means they can get depth perception, which is really crucial and important um, as many of these primates are living in the trees. Um, and it's really uh, important to have that depth perception when you're moving from branch to branch. Um, also to help with that tree lifestyle, um, they have grasping hands. Now, opposable thumbs means that they can touch the fingertips of each of their fingers to their thumb and really use those digits to grasp. Most, but not all, there are a few exceptions of primates that have um, lost that opposable thumb over time um, because it's just not advantageous. And we'll actually talk about that um, when we get to those primate groups. Um, but generally they all have grasping hands with opposable thumbs. Primates are also known for being really intelligent. So they have large brains compared to their body size. Um, and that's something that definitely factors in into how we care for them here at Southwicks. Um, another feature that's uh, common across primates is that on those grasping hands, they have fingernails instead of claws. So we think of most other animals have really sharp claws. Um, whereas primates have flat nails. And again, that relates to how they're moving about and spending a lot of time in the trees. Um, and something that's not unique to primates, but it's common among the group is that they have um, a small number of young. So some species have two or three young at a time. A lot of other species only have one, um, but they're not having large litters like some other animals we think of like rabbits or cats or dogs. Um, so very small young that require a lot of care from mom um, to be able to grow up. Um, and in terms of where primates live, uh, we can see them generally all across the globe, except you'll notice some gaps for North America Europe and Australia. 
Um, so Australia is kind of unique being, you know, an island, they have their own unique animals and primates never made, made it out there. Um, there were primates at one time in North America um, when the continents were a little bit closer together. Um, and then as the continents were shifting and the climate was changing, um, they died out in those areas and stuck to, you can see really along the equator where it's nice and warm. Um, so most of the primates that are alive today live in rainforest, hot, humid areas. There are a few that have branched out into non-forested areas, but they're um, usually the exception to that rule. So along the equator um, is where we'll find most of our primates today. All right, um, in terms of the kinds of primates that are out there, um, uh, you'll see I share a lot of these um, graphics that I share are from a company called Peppermint Narwhal. I love them. Um, you can find them on Facebook. They have their own website. Um, they do a lot of great graphics that are informational um, without being too overwhelming and that are just really fun. So I use their work quite a bit. Um, and this is one that they did for, um, there's a primate day, because of course there's a holiday for all animals. So this is their primate family tree. Um, so you can see there's a couple main groups and we'll talk about all of these today. Um, so there are the strepsirines down here. Um, those are those uh, more primitive primates, um, things like lemurs, bush babies, and loris. They look a little bit more dog or cat-like in their facial features. They have more of a snout. And then the haplorines um, are going to be where we get all of the monkey species and ape species. Um, and so I obviously don't expect you to know all these names and groups, um, but this is just kind of an overview to think about how they're related and we'll touch upon this throughout as well. All right, so um, the first big group that we're gonna look at are those strepsirines. Um, so those are those lemurs and lorises. And as you can see, just from the pictures up top there, like I said, they tend to have um, more of a dog or cat-like snout to them, um, not the flat faces that we might associate with monkeys and apes. Um, most are arboreal. They tend to have a little bit of a smaller brain size. Um, and the thing that really distinguishes them from the other primates is that they have um, what we call wet noses. That's where strepsirine comes from. Um, so again, similar to your cat or your dog. Um, and they also have a really cool feature called a tooth comb, which is what it sounds like. Their bottom incisors are uh, elongated and pushed together in a comb-like structure um, that we believe is used mostly for grooming purposes. Um, and so that's, there are of course other features that make them different from that other group, um, but those are the two main ones we look for. So, um, we're gonna focus on just the lemurs today because we don't have any lorises or bush babies at Southwick Zoo. Um, there are, as the graphic shows, over a hundred living lemur species today, um, but they're all found on the island of Madagascar, which is off the coast of Africa. So um, they are uh, very isolated to that one area. And unfortunately, because of that, they're all either endangered or critically endangered um, because they are only found in that one area. Um, but because there are no other primate species on Madagascar, we have all different kinds of lemurs that fill different um, ecological roles in that environment. So there are some that live in the wetter areas, the drier areas, um, some that spend more time on the ground, some that spend more time in the taller trees. Uh, there are bamboo lemurs, there are tiny mouse lemurs, so all different sizes and kinds. Um, they're a really fascinating group, but all live on Madagascar. So um, here at Southwick Zoo, the biggest group of lemurs we have are our ringtail lemurs. Um, and so this is what they look like. They're known for that nice striped tail that they have. Um, they also feature heavily in the movie Madagascar, for any of you familiar with that movie or have young kids. Um, you can see that they're um, not very large um, and they are a pretty terrestrial species. So they're gonna spend most of their time on the ground. Um, they are only about five pounds, so on the smaller side. Um, they are omnivores, so they eat a variety of plants, fruits, and um, occasional meat in the form of lizards, snakes, um, little critters that they might find, insects as well. Um, what's unique about these lemurs is that they live in really big female-dominated groups. So um, the, the matrilines and the females of the, um, the group are the dominant individuals normally across other, or I shouldn't say normally, but usually across other primates, it's the males that are dominating the groups in terms of social hierarchy. 
Um, something that ringtail lemurs are known for are stink fights. Um, so they have uh, scent glands on their wrists that they will rub along their tails. Um, and then they kind of wave or throw their tails towards each other in what is called the stink fight. Um, now, I really haven't been able to smell what that stink is. So it's something that's very perceptible to them and to each other, um, but not really something that humans can pick up on. Um, thankfully for us, I have to work with them in close quarters. They're not as smelly as the name might imply. Um, as I mentioned, all lemur species are either endangered or critically endangered. So these guys are endangered, so they're doing a little bit better than some of the other species, um, but are still at risk of extinction, mainly because of habitat loss in the area. Um, here at Southwicks, um, this is the blue text there, we have a large group of nine that are out on exhibit. Um, right now that's made up of five males and four females. Um, we usually have a few babies each year. Um, we don't have any at the moment this year. It's possible we might have some later in the spring. Um, it's possible that they might just take a year off from breeding. We kind of let nature take its course for that group. Um, and so it's a natural breeding group. Um, and see what babies we get each season. Um, we also have an older pair that are uh, retired, so to speak. So they are kept off exhibit. We keep them comfortable and happy and healthy, um, but they're a little bit older in age and are past breeding age. So we have separated them from the main group um, and keep them off exhibit. So they're a little less stressed um, than the group that's out dealing with the public all of the time. Um, so here um, is just a quick video of uh, our lemurs eating. There's no sound to this video, um, but as you can see, even though they do spend a lot of time on the ground, um, they are very adept climbers. Um, and we have lots of structures in their enclosure to allow them to climb and jump around. Um, they're just eating some romaine lettuce in this clip. So they get a variety of fruits and vegetables here at the zoo. Um, and they do have um, some nice sharp teeth in there to help them rip apart those leaves and vegetables. So the next um, two species that we'll talk about of lemurs are both um, in the same genus. So they're called ruffed lemurs. They have a little bit of a fluffier look to them. Uh, we have red ruffed and black and white ruffed lemurs. Um, so our red ruff we'll start with first. They're a little bit bigger than the ringtails, um, seven to eight pounds. Uh, they will occasionally eat insects, but a, to a much lesser extent than our ringtail friends. So they're considered frugivores, mainly eating fruit. Um, and these lemurs are interesting in that they usually have two to three young at a time, and they actually nest them. Um, so for most primates, they're going to be carrying their young with them um, around at all times. But these guys create a nest and leave those, park those infants behind while they go out foraging and come back to check on them. Um, so they're a little different from the rest of the order in that sense. Um, unfortunately, these red rough lemurs are critically endangered, so fewer numbers of them. Um, here at the zoo, we have a family group of four. Uh, we have Rex, uh, who's the father, Ruby, the mother, and then um, twins that are now four years old, um, Tyrion and Jamie, named after Game of Thrones for any of you Game of Thrones fans out there. Um, their lifespan is about 15 to 20 years, um, so we will have that family group probably for a while. Um, as the, the kids get a little bit older, we might work with another facility to move them out um, so that they can start their own breeding group um, and have the parents decide if they want to have um, more offspring or just keep them as a bonded pair after that. Um, our black and white lemurs, rough lemurs, right now we also have a mated pair, Louie and Lucy. Uh, we haven't had any kids from them yet. Um, they're both about five years old, so they're a little bit young. They're just starting to reach sexual maturity now, so we'll see if they decide to have any offspring um, in the future. Um, but they're pretty much the same as our red rough lemurs, just a different color that we're working with here. And so um, just to let you guys uh, see how they might move around. This is, uh, I believe this is Ruby, one of our red rough lemurs just kind of hanging out, enjoying the sun. But you can get a really good look at that foot there with the opposable toe in addition to their hands that have the opposable thumbs. Um, so they can grasp with their hands and their feet. Um, and then this is just a quick video clip. Um, I thought it was fun. There's a fun surprise at the end here. That's why I threw it in. I won't give it away yet. 
<laughs> so we had kind of a photo bomb, video bomber there. <laughs> As you can see, they're very curious um, and very friendly to the staff. So when we were trying to get some video of them moving around, one decided to get a little close up. Um, and you can see in this still shot here, um, those nice nails that they do have covering the top of their fingers that help give protection, just like our fingernails protect our nails. Um, and that padded area on the palm of their hands um, which is furless to really help give them traction on the trees. All right, so let's move on to our monkeys now. So the monkeys we can think of in two big groups. We have our New World monkeys, um, which are found in the New World, which would be the Americas, Central and South America, versus our Old World monkeys, which are those species that are going to be found in Africa and Asia. Um, they do have um, different features that we can classify them into these two groups, even if we didn't know where they were from. Um, their dentition or their teeth are a little different. Um, the, their faces look a little different. Um, and uh, the sizing is a little different. Something that's really cool about the New World primates is that some of those species have prehensile tails, which means they can use that tail to grab onto things just like a fifth limb. So they're a fun group. Um, so we're going to start with our smallest New World monkey, and that's our common marmosets. Um, we, right now we have a father-daughter pair, Damien and Callie, who live um, outside of our education building here. And uh, they are very small, as you can see. They weigh less than a pound um, and only get to be six to eight inches. So they're one of, they're not the smallest species. That title goes to the pygmy marmoset. Um, but they are definitely one of the smallest species. Um, and these guys are unique in that they not only eat fruit, um, but they focus on gums. Um, so that sap or inner gum that's coming from those trees. And to help them get at those gums, they have really oversized incisors compared to their body size that are like kind of built in shovels in their mouth that they can use to gouge out the bark. Um, they also have some nails that are more claw shaped. Now we know this is a secondary adaptation. It's not a nail um, in the same sense as a cat nail or a dog nail um, in that it's not connected to the bone. It is like our fingernails where it sits on top. It's just been, um, to, uh, the adaptation is to be more claw like so that they can really hold on to that bark while they're gouging out for that gum. Um, so it is something that has secondarily evolved over time in the species to be more like a claw, but it's still a true nail. Um, this species is also known for aloe parenting, which means that everybody in the group shares responsibility for parenting. Um, they usually have two uh, kids at a time, so twins. And when those young are born, they can make up to 25% of mom's body weight. Um, and when you're already really tiny, that's a lot of extra weight on you to be carrying around and feeding. Um, so most of the time, those twins, after about the first week, are spending time on dad or um, brother or sister or aunt or uncle, basically anyone else in the group to give mom a break. And then those other adults will just return those infants to mom every few hours or so to get some uh, nursing time in and then go off again. Um, so really, really good example of group parenting in this species. Um, they're native to northeastern Brazil and they are considered least concern in terms of conservation status. So even though um, rainforests are disappearing in, in Brazil, um, these guys are still doing well number wise, but we're keeping an eye on it. Um, very closely related, we have our cotton top tamarins here at Southwick Zoo. Um, they're the tiniest bit bigger than our marmosets. Um, they also are, are specializing in gums and fruits, um, but they add some insects to their diet as well. Um, these are native to Northwest Colombia, and they're unfortunately critically endangered because they're found in an area where the deforestation is, is um, more frequent than when where the marmosets are found. Um, so we're really happy that we have these species, this particular species at Southwick Zoo, so we can talk about their conservation plate in the wild and bring some attention and awareness to their wild cousins. Um, we have a family group of seven right now at the zoo. Um, and again, they're le left to breed naturally on their own. So that number changes from year to year, depending upon um, if we have new babies each season or not. And I had to share this little video. These are our twins from 2019. So they're a little bit bigger than in this, they are in this video. But as you can see, they're very quickly passed from one adult to the other and just cling on to the backs of the adults there um, until they start getting big enough to explore on their own. Uh, 
All right, uh, moving on to some of our slightly larger New World monkeys. Um, we have tufted capuchins that are also known as black capped capuchins or brown capuchins. They have a couple different names, um, but they are characterized that, by that patch of black hair on the top of their heads. Um, they're a little bit bigger, um, ranging in size from five to 10 pounds with the males being a little bit larger than the females. They are omnivores. They definitely eat a little bit of everything that they can find. Um, these guys have a semi prehensile tail, um, so they can't fully support their body weight by hanging from their tail, um, but they can use it to grasp around light objects um, and they often will use it to carry food um, or tools around with them. These uh, monkeys are very intelligent. They're known for using rocks to crack open nuts. Um, and using sticks to break into things. So tool use is very common in this species. They are found in uh, South America, excuse me, um, and they are of least concern. So their numbers are doing pretty well right now. Um, here at Southwick Zoo, we have a group of seven individuals um, with five males and two females. Now that is a bit unusual because they are male dominant. So usually these groups have one dominant male and the rest females. Um, we're able to have the two adult males uh, live peacefully together because one of them was actually hand raised um, when it was younger. It was rejected by mom. So um, keeper staff stepped in to raise it. And so he is just very submissive and is cool with um, not being the one in charge. So the two males get along just fine with our group, which is great. Um, Males in the group uh, in the wild, they usually leave their family group at around seven years of age to, to start their own new family. So that is something here at the zoo um, that we do monitor. We, um, you know, our groups of animals here can't naturally uh, emigrate or leave their groups when it's time to do so. Um, so we need to keep an eye and make sure there's no fighting with family and kind of help them by working with other facilities that have uh, the similar species to move around individuals so that we can help create new family groups for them so that they're um, basically exhibiting natural behaviors and what they would do in the wild. Um, this is one of my favorite video clips. This is um, enrichment, which we'll talk about in a a bit um, later too, but enrichment that we gave for our capuchins. Um, so again, because they're so intelligent, you know, finding different ways to make sure they're stimulated and using those brains. Um, so we presented this cart outside of their enclosure um, and the stick next to it. And uh, this guy here was smart enough to put two and two together and pick up that stick. And you can see that he was successful at pushing those grapes where he needed to go. Um, and then we have the other monkeys that are watching and, and learning. Um, we do have some that are a little bit lazier than others that will wait for someone else to do the work and then just reap the rewards. Um, but it's really fascinating to watch them figure out new puzzles that we give them. Um, this is another type of capuchin called a white-faced capuchin. Um, so you can see the coloring is different. Uh, these are really commonly known as the organ grinder monkeys. So um, monkeys that used to be with street vendors, uh, they're really great pickpocketers. Um, so they can be trained. Um, they're very mischievous, very smart. Um, so we have a group of three individuals here um, and they're actually all former pets or household monkeys, which we definitely would not recommend. Um, we have Alex, Zoe, and Elmer. And Elmer um, is unique in that he's missing all of his teeth. And that is because as a pet, they were all pulled. Um, so capuchins do have some really nice size uh, canine teeth. Um, to help them crack open those nuts and seeds they might be eating in the wild. So uh, people that do think that they make good pets or want them in their home, if they do have them, they oftentimes pull the canines or even all of their teeth, like in Elmer's case, to make them safer to be around humans, um, although that is you know, not a good thing for the animal. He's adjusted just fine. Um, he actually chooses to dip his harder food items in water to soak them first. Um, so he chooses to do that on his own and, and make it a little easier for him to eat, but he is doing well despite not having any teeth. Um, and because they were sort of all raised in human environments, they don't understand how to be with other monkeys. Um, but they do understand how to be with each other. So we're very grateful that they get along and can be in a group together um, so that they don't have to be separated. Another um, new world monkey that we have here are squirrel monkeys. Um, they're a little bit smaller in size compared to the capuchins. 
Um, so you can see they're only about two pounds fully grown. They're found in Central and South America. There are a couple different subspecies. Um, right now we have a group of four. Um, they're kind of tucked away by our kitty ride area, if you're familiar with the zoo. Um, so right now we have three males and one female. Um, and they're really interesting um, in terms of behaviors. They do something called urine washing. So they will actually um, urinate on their hands and feet and rub that all over as a way of scent marking. Um, and then also it, it gives them a little stickiness to help them stay on those branches. So um, a great adaptation for them to stay in the trees. Not such a great adaptation to have when you're a zookeeper and you're in with them and they're jumping all over you and you start thinking about what's left behind on your shirt at the end of the day, um, but something that is uh, unique to that species. All right, so those are the new world monkeys that we have. So I just put this graphic back up. We're going to switch to the old world monkeys now. Um, and so none of these guys have those prehensile tails. Um, unlike the New World monkeys, they live in a more variety, varied habitat. So we have some more terrestrial species here. Um, so there, and a lot of these primate, a lot of these monkeys, excuse me, have cheek pouches, um, which we'll talk about help. Um, so the first species we'll talk about are, are Schmitz Gwenin. Um, they're also known as red-tailed monkeys. You'll see in a second why that is. Um, they're kind of medium sized, so seven to 13 pounds. They love their fruit. Um, they do live in very large groups. They're found in Central and East Africa, and thankfully their numbers are doing well right now. Um, here at Southwicks, we have a group of eight at the moment with three males and five females, um, and they do live in multi-male, multi-female groups in the wild, so that's pretty typical of what you would see out in Africa. And I'm just going to play this video um, while I'm continuing to talk. So this is during um, one of our summer seasons. Um, they, we give them kitty pools, so um, the water is cleaner than it looks in this video, but they do jump right from the mulch into the water, so they don't mind it getting a little dirty. Um, but it provides a really great way of um, cooling them down, giving them a different substrate and texture. Um, sometimes we will put food in the water so they have to forage. Um, and you can see in this video, um, they do have bright red tails, um, which is how they get that other name. Um, we have a pair of uh, wolf squenins, um, so related to the Schmidt squenins, um, but different coloration. Uh, we have a mated pair right now, Acorn and Yosemite Sam. Um, these guys have an interesting story. So they were actually confiscated um, from the bushmeat trade. So uh, poachers illegally hunted and captured a group of guenins um, and that they were trying to sell for the bushmeat uh, market. And uh, officials, government officials got caught or got wind of it and were able to rescue them um, and then import them into the United States. So we got a pair of them um, and the rest of the group were went to other facilities um, so that they could have new homes and not have to worry about being part of the bush meat train. Um, usually there's one dominant male in the group. Um, we just have a mated pair right now, but we're hoping that we, they might produce some offspring and start their own family group here. Um, another type of uh, Gwenin or old world monkey is our Debraza monkey. Um, these guys are known for that white coloration around their muzzle there. Um, it looks like they have beards. And they're a little, or, or sorry, also on the medium size, um, What's cool about this species is that they're sexually dimorphic. So the males are bigger and um, have brighter coloration on their face than the females. So it's easy to tell apart the, the genders there. Um, they are native to West Africa. Um, and right now we have a family group of five. So mom is Fiona, Guinness is the dad. Um, and they always have a couple of kids running around. Um, Fiona has a new infant with her um, about every year to two years, which is uh, perfectly natural um, what in what you would see out in the wild. Um, and then those kids would stay with the group um, until they're about five to six years old. Um, and so again, that is when we would work with other facilities across the country um, to place them so that they can start their own family groups. Um, and this is just a really cute little video clip of two of the youngsters um, play wrestling. So this is definitely how they learn how to use their muscles and move around. Um, and be active monkeys. Um, they're so always fun to watch. So just like human children, they're all constantly fighting with each other. That's what you get with these guys as well. Um, and so you can see they have long tails that help them in the trees, um, but they are not going to be able to grab onto anything with those tails because they're not prehensile. 
Um, another species that we have here are the grivet monkeys. They're also known as vervet monkeys, green monkeys. They have a lot of names they go by. Um, there's a big range in size. So females are definitely smaller than the males um, and can be as small as three pounds. Males can get up to 14 pounds. They also like to live in large groups. Um, they're native to East Africa. They spend more time in the more dry woodland areas compared to the rainforest. Um, here at Southwix, we have a group of nine individuals right now with six males and three females. Um, our youngest member of the group was born in December of 2019, so um, starting to get a few years old. And they're very similar in terms of the Debraza monkey. Of um, it'll, They usually stay with the group until they're about five or six years old. All right. Um, and this is the video. There is some noise here. Um, we gave the monkeys, in this case, some bamboo. And so you can see this individual is using teeth to rip that bamboo apart and get to the inner layers. All right. Um, another old world monkey that we have are Pattis monkeys. Uh, these are also sexually dimorphic. So this is a picture of our male. Males get a lot bigger than the females. Um, so they're gonna top the scales around 15 pounds. The females are gonna be more in the eight to nine pound range. They are found in Sub-Saharan Africa and um, they are really interesting and known for being the fastest primates. So they are gonna spend more time on the ground compared to the other species we just looked at. And so they have slightly longer legs compared to their body size com relative to the other primates. Um, and they can get up to um, 30 miles per hour, which doesn't sound super fast, but is the fastest among our primate friends um, who are more, usually more well adapted to spending time in the trees um, and jumping and leaping versus running. Uh, right now we have a group of five. We have our dominant male, uh, three females, and then currently one youngster um, who was born about a year ago. And this is a video clip of um, two of the females and one of the younger individuals foraging. Um, so we have repurposed that kiddie pool. We have a couple of the pools around the zoo. Um, instead of filling it with water, we have some mulch and then we threw in some insects and there are some superworms and mealworms for them to practice their natural foraging skills. Moving right along, uh, next are our crested mangabees, um, black crested mangabees. So they're a little bit bigger, about 10 to 18 pounds. Um, they are native to Central Africa, so in those rainforests um, of the Congo and Gabon. Um, they're considered near threatened, so they're not quite endangered, but um, fortunately their numbers are declining, um, again, mostly due to deforestation and also poaching. Um, here at Southwix, we have a mated pair called Wacko and Dot. Um, if any of you are familiar with the, the TV animated show, The Animaniacs, um, but the name Wacko is very fitting for our male because he has quite the personality um, and can be very active. Uh, so it's a good fitting name for him. Um, and this is a very quick clip, just a few seconds, um, but this was a piece of enrichment, just a repurposed child children's slide that we put in, um, and he spent quite a bit of time uh, just going down it. So um, I'll let you guys enjoy this clip. So a very quick clip, but he basically would run back up to the top and do that again for uh, most of the day when we first put it in there and then revisit it throughout the week as well. Um, getting a little bit bigger in size, we have our mandrels. Um, now they are sexually dimorphic as well. The males are a lot more vibrant in color on their face and about twice the size of the females. Um, so easy to tell apart. 
And they are unfortunately um, considered vulnerable in terms of conservation status because they do spend more of their time in those very heavily um, treed rainforest areas. So they like it when it's hot and humid. Um, and those are the areas that are being torn down for habitat um, loss and to make clearings for agricultural land. So they are considered vulnerable. Um, here at the zoo, we have a family group of four. Montu is our big dominant male. Skeeter and Maggie are our adult females. Um, and then we have one young um, individual that was born last March, um, yet to be named because we are not quite sure male or female yet. Um, they're a little bit hard to tell when they're young. Um, these are pictures of various um, of various individuals. So the top left is our male Montu. So you can see that very bright coloration on his face. Um, he seems a little bit bigger in size than the female sitting behind him. The top right is of one of our adult females, that's Skeeter. Um, so she is fully grown and that is as colorful and as big as her face is going to be for a female. And then the bottom picture is of um, two of the younger individuals. Um, so our other female and then that's not the current youngest one, um, but a young one we've had in the past. So you can see that that coloration in their face develops over time. So when they're first born and when they're young, um, it's a little bit more difficult to tell the sex of the individual. And as they get older, especially if they're male, that coloration gets brighter and deeper as they get older. All right, so that those are all the old world monkey species that we have here. Um, so moving on to our last group, which are the apes. Um, so as you can see, that includes um, gibbons and siamings, orangutans, which we unfortunately don't have here at the zoo, um, gorillas, which we also do not have here at the zoo, uh, chimpanzees, which we do, and also includes ourselves. Um, so a lot of the times you might hear the term um, non-human primate, and that is because humans are considered part of the primate order. Um, so when we say non-human primate, we're talking about all of the other friends that we are, were just seeing and talking about, um, excluding ourselves. Um, the main difference between apes and monkeys is that they the apes lack a tail. So all of the monkeys we saw, even those mandrels that had a short nub of a tail, um, do have a tail, whereas apes do not. Um, there are some other features. Apes generally have longer arms compared to their legs. Uh, we are the exception to that rule um, and spend a lot of time in the trees, although there are some exceptions. So the first ape species that we have here at Southwick Zoo are white-handed or lar gibbons. Um, they're smaller in size. They're sometimes called lesser apes compared to the other bigger ape species like chimps and gorillas. And they are frugivores, mainly eating fruit. Um, White-handed gibbons are native to Thailand and Indonesia, um, and they're unique among, well, not unique, but um, their social organization is interesting because gibbons are usually found in monogamous family groups, which is not very common across primate species. Um, so usually primates are found in multi-male, multi-female groups or in male-dominated groups where there's only one male and a lot of females, um, or in those female-dominated groups like we talked about with the lemurs. Um, but monogamous groups are very um, uncommon in the primate world. So um, gibbons are unique in that way. Unfortunately, they are endangered. So being native to Indonesia, many of you might be familiar with the palm oil uh, plantations that are out there. And to make way for those plantations, a lot of the forests are cleared. So uh, gibbons and their sympatric orangutans that also live in those same areas are very highly endangered because of that practice. So the best thing that we can do to help wild gibbon populations is look for palm oil free items um, or uh, sustainable um, palm oil items. Um, and those can be found by looking at the ingredient list and there's some uh, logos that you can look for too on your products. And palm oil is found in food, it's found in shampoos and soaps. Um, it's in a lot of products that you wouldn't necessarily think about. So. If you take the time to look at the ingredient list and where those items are coming from, that can go a long way in helping conserve these animals in their wild habitats. Um, here at the zoo, we have two um, enclosures of gibbons. We have a family group. Um, Goldie is the mom, Jeffrey is the dad, and right now they have two um, kids with them. Um, they have, now unlike the monkeys that might have another baby um, every year or every two years, um, apes 
space their kids out a little bit more um, because it takes a little bit longer for them to become independent and to develop. So a slower developmental time. So our gibbons are gonna have a new infant every three to four years. Um, the, the youngest one that we have in that family group right now was just born last April, so just turned a year old. Um, so they're very cute. Uh, and we also have another bonded pair. Um, I'm not gonna say mated pair because uh, we don't expect any offspring from them, but they are a bonded pair, uh, Ralphie and Gabby. And the reason why they get so long, along, they get along so well together, um, excuse me, is because they were both hand raised. Um, now that's something we try not to do with our primates because they might develop some non-natural behaviors, um, some human behaviors. But uh, the circumstances for both Ralphie and Gabby um, were that they weren't being taken care of properly by their moms. And so um, instead of letting them suffer, keepers stepped in to help take care of them and raise them. Um, thankfully, they get along well with each other um, and display all of the typical given behaviors that we would expect them to display. So they're doing very well here at Southwick Zoo. Um, Gabby is kind of our older gal. She is about 27 years old. Um, an average lifespan for Gibbons is about 30 years. So she's getting up there in age, but is still doing very well. And we're happy um, to have her here at Southwicks. Now, Gibbons are known for having their really long arms. Um, and so when they move through the trees, um, they're not going to move through on all fours like a lot of the monkey species. They're going to do something called brachiation, which is this arm over arm movement. Um, so this is just a little clip of um, these guys moving around. Um, I also mentioned you can see their hands um, are, their fingers are much more elongated compared to some of the other uh, monkey species here um, to really give them that hook like hand to help hang on to the top of the branches when they're moving around arm to arm. Um, now, um, oops. Sorry. Um, so of uh, closely related uh, species are Siamangs. They're part of the overall gibbon family, um, but these guys are darker in coloration and um, they're limited in where they're found to Malaysia. They're also a little bit different from, their gib from the gibbons in that they're more folivorous, meaning that they eat more leaves in their diet compared to fruit. Um, they're also known for their calls or their duets. So they have uh, territorial calls um, that they are unique to each individual pair and family group um, so that they can tell the groups apart. And these calls can be heard up to two miles away. So very loud. Um, and what enables them to have such loud calls is they actually have a throat sac that they can inflate with air that helps carry that sound. Um, right now at Southwicks, we have a group of four. Uh, we have Mom, Carrie, Dad, Jasper, um, and their youngest, Jameson and Charlotte. And they are really fun to watch, very active. Um, here they are on the ground, but they do spend a lot of time up in the trees. Um, we give them lots of structures to climb on and rope to swing from. And I'm gonna share this video. It's a little bit um, longer than the previous clips, but it shows them moving around. But more importantly, um, if your speakers are up, you might want to turn them down just a little bit um, because this does have their call, which is fairly loud, but it's a very impressive sound. So I'm going to play it now. Um, beware if you have any pets nearby. A dog or cat might take offense to the sound. <laughs> All right, so um, <laughs> hopefully that wasn't too alarming of a noise, um, but you can see even in this still picture that inflated throat sac. Um, and what's really 
fun uh, to hear is as the kids get older, their pitch kind of changes. So um, that really uh, kind of softer whoop that you heard in there was the littlest one joining in and, and doing um, her best to claim her territory with her family, um, but their pitch kind of changes and matches each other as they get older and they can produce a, a deeper, um, more fuller sound. Um, but they are, that's one of my favorite sounds here at the zoo. Usually they will call first thing in the morning um, and towards the end of the day as well, just to alert everybody that they are claiming their enclosure and their home um, and that they're there. So very fun. And then last but not least, um, our largest ape that we have here are our chimpanzees. Uh, males are a little bit larger than the females, so there is some range in that size there. They are omnivores, they eat a little bit of everything and they are very opportunistic feeders out in the wild. Um, if they can catch a small mammal um, or a lizard or a snake, they'll eat that as well. Um, some of the chimpanzee troops actively hunt other animals in the wild. Um, but most of their diet is going to be made up of fruits and leaves. They are found all across sub-Saharan Africa, um, so sort of along that middle belt there um, in Central, East and West Africa in the sub-Saharan uh, range. Um, chimpanzees usually live in big groups um, that are called fission fusion groups. So a uh, community might have over 150 individuals, but they split up into smaller groups of about 20 to 30 individuals during the day to go off foraging and patrolling. And then they might come back together in one big group at the end of the night. Um, they do nest each night um, and have home ranges that they are territorial about. So um, you can definitely track their movements of different populations and groups. They are endangered in the wild, again, mostly due to habitat loss, but they are victims of poaching and the bushmeat crisis as well, unfortunately. Um, here at Southwick Zoo, we have a group of four. Um, we have Terry and Tabitha and their daughter, Tansy. Um, Tansy is about 12 years old, so she's about uh, teenage years and chimp. Um, and then we have an older adult female, Jingles, um, who is the one on the left in that picture there. Um, and she's quite extraordinary because she's going to be 52 this year. And on average, chimpanzees live about 40 to 45 years. So um, she is beyond that average age. She's still doing very well. She started to lose a little bit of her hearing and her sight in her old age, just like what sometimes happens with us. Um, but thankfully, we you know have a great animal care team that can take care of her. We have a great vet on staff that's monitoring her. Um, so all of her needs are being met and taken care of even in her old age. Um, now this video is some is one of my favorite videos. Um, we gave them a large mirror and that's our female Tabitha checking herself out there in the mirror. Um, so chimps are one of the few animal species that do have self-awareness and self-recognition. Um, so most other animal species, if you put a mirror in front of them, they're going to act like they're seeing a different animal. They don't recognize it's themselves. Um, and this is Tansy, our, our teenager. So you can see that she throws some fits sometimes. Um, and this is back to, to Tabitha, our female. And now she's checking out her teeth and her mouth. So very curious, very intelligent um, animals that we have. <laughs> flipping her lip down to prove that she knows it's her, taking a look there. Um, and you can see Tansy swinging above her. Um, so something that I wanted to mention that you might have noticed throughout the videos that I was showing um, is something that we call enrichment. And so that is something that we offer all of our animals here at Southwick Zoo. Um, the definition there, the official definition is a process for enhancing an animal environment within the context of that animal's sociobiology and natural history, and it promotes species typical behavior. Um, so basically what that means is we give them things to stimulate their natural behavior. So whether that's foraging, whether that's locomotion, the way they move around their enclosure, um, whether that's social interaction with uh, other individuals of their species or interaction with keepers, a training session, um, we make sure to um, stimulate all of their senses and natural behavior so that they're not um, seemingly bored or um, promoting any non-natural behavior. So um, the structures that they climb on, uh, the food that we give them, puzzles, toys, anything like that, all go towards uh, keeping their welfare as as high up there as we can get it to be. 
Um, and along those notes, the last thing I'll leave you guys with is um, just this video clip that we shot uh, a few years ago now, but of some of our primate keepers telling you uh, what it's like for them to take care of the animals here at the zoo and what they like about it. Um, so I think they say it the best in their own words. So I will uh, let them do that in this video. Hi, my name is Brittany Brasso and I am a primate keeper here at Southwick Zoo. My name is Jeff Lanchansky. I am a primate zookeeper four days a week and a hoofstock zookeeper one day a week. So as a primate keeper at the zoo, we usually start our day with produce. So we get all the produce ready, we cut up their diets, and it's for all the uh, species of monkeys that we have and as well as the other animals we take care of. We have lots of tools and things that we need, buckets, rakes and shovels, hay for the animals. We load up the trucks with the primates. We actually split up into two groups. One does one side and one does the other. So it depends on what side you're on, what animals you're cleaning. But basically we clean and feed. Our first pen that we do every single day is the kangaroo pen. On hoofstock, it's basically loading the truck with the tools, going up to, we usually start at the giraffes and just start cleaning the pens. The thing I most look forward to, I think, is just seeing the animals and interacting with them seeing how they are every day. And I usually just look forward to going to see how the animals are behaving on that day. I like to see, even still after being here 15 years, I like to see all the monkeys, you know, they see the truck and they just get so excited. They know the food's coming. They're always so happy. Different cues we can take from the animals. Sometimes you know if uh, an animal doesn't want to cooperate, if they're you know, giving you bad looks or if they're screaming at you or the chimpanzees, for instance, the little one Tansy does throw things at us or gets upset inside. And so usually what happens with that is we ignore them and walk away because you don't want to enforce that behavior. We keep certain records and logs throughout the day. We have a normal hay sheet to make sure everybody's kept clean throughout the day. We have a zookeeping log which we keep everything in so if there's births or unfortunate deaths or injuries or medicine that anybody takes, we do log all that on um, and it gets sent into a system. The best day in my memory that I've had is probably just being hired here. <laughs> it was a pretty amazing thing to know that this is an actual real job and I was being allowed to do it, so that was very exciting. My best day I think would be when Tansy was born, the baby chimp. It was really cool to see Tabitha carrying her that day and raising her and just watching like a little baby chimp turn into what she is now. People always ask, especially around here, like, do you love your job? And I always say, absolutely. I said, it's totally worth it. You know, like, it's, it's a lot of work and a lot goes into it, but it's absolutely worth it to have the basic interaction with the different animals and just to see the way they're all totally unique personalities. It's really cool to see that. So um, I know that was a lot of information. We have a lot of primates here, um, but if you have any questions, we've definitely got um, some time left here. All right. Uh, we have one question from Vipul. Um, are there any habitat restoration efforts for these species? Good question. Um, so there are some habitat restoration efforts in um, some areas of Central and South America, um, some areas of Central Africa as well, um, but they are not the easiest projects to um, one, get funding for, or two, to initiate and get going. Um, if we think about the reasons why the forests were cut down in the first place, it's usually to make room for agricultural lands or just human um, development, so housing. And so uh, you would have to basically kick those people out of their new homes um, and start replanting trees. So there have been some efforts to reforest and replant trees in areas that we can, but unfortunately the space is um, disappearing as well. So it's not always possible to um, get those areas back up and running. And then even if we do reforest an area, uh, making sure that we're not just creating another forest fragment that isolates groups of animals is the difficulty as well. So one project or um, group of projects that does seem to be helping with these forest fragments are creating wildlife bridges 
um, whether that's creating a tree line that to connect forest fragments or an actual bridge um, that's lined with grass and trees, uh, basically to create a corridor for these wildlife to migrate or to move between patches without having to cross a road or an electrical line um, makes it a little bit safer and easier for them to migrate. But um, there's still a lot of areas, unfortunately, where populations are becoming isolated or just losing their homes completely. That's a good question. Yeah, thanks. Um, a second question, uh, this this one referencing uh, an incident that happened a while back at a different zoo. Could a Harambe type of situation occur at Southwicks? I don't know how you want to handle that one. <laughs> yeah, um, so of course, so when we're designing enclosures to begin with, um, we have a lot of factors to keep in mind. So, um, of course, the safety of the animals is always at the top of our minds, um, but the safety of people also needs to be up there as well. Um, however, that also, all of those two things need to be balanced with um, viewability, right? So people come to the zoo to see the animals. So if we're putting in enclosures that are completely walled in, you can't see the animal, um, you know, our visitors get upset because they can't see. But if we have a completely open enclosure, then, you know, that presents the risks of people getting in or animals getting out. So there is definitely a lot that goes into even just the design before we even have the animals in there. Um, now, once the animal's in there, you know, we have to monitor. So our chimpanzee enclosure, we have a number of barriers. So um, I'm not going to ever say never say never, right? Um, but I think it's very unlikely that we would ever have a Harambe type of situation here, um, simply because you would have to cross a wooden fence, um, a garden area, then you would have to go down into a dry moat, climb back up the other side, cross a hot wire, and then you would be with it with the chimpanzees. Um, so it would take you quite a bit to get to where the animals actually were. Um, honestly, even with the Harambe incident, you know, that was something that every facility and zookeeper um, has nightmares about. We never want the public to be put into any danger. We never want our animals to be put in danger. Um, unfortunately, we have found that there are just some people who will find a way in with the animals if they really want to, no matter how much preparation or how much thinking or design we put into um, an enclosure beforehand to make it as safe as possible. There is always someone that is going to find a way if they really want to. Um, and that's when we unfortunately have these situations where we have to make really quick decisions. Um, and policy is to save human life over animals, which, um, is not an easy policy to have or an easy decision to make in the moment, but that is the policy. Um, and so that, you know, we hope that we never are put in those decisions or um, those situations to make those decisions. Yeah, uh, thank you for that. Sure. Very good explanation of, of everything that you had to, of, that you have to balance when designing enclosures. Um, uh, Diane asks a couple of questions. We'll go with the first one about how many primate babies are born each year at South Lake Zoo? Ooh, good question. Um, it does vary year to year. Um, so as I mentioned, the monkeys that we have usually have babies every year or two. Um, so we usually have some Debrazas, some Schmitz, and some Vervet babies each spring. Um, the apes, the gibbons, and the chimps um, don't have infants as often. So um, we actually haven't had our last baby chimp was Tansy, so 12 years ago. We don't think that the adults are going to breed more, which is fine. We're, um, you know, happy with our small troop. Um, our gibbons we usually have from our family group. Um, she's a pretty good mom, so she usually has a new baby um, every three to four years, which is definitely typical for that species. Um, so it kind of just depends, but usually we have at least a few uh, primate babies each season. How adorable. Um, and then the, the second question, how many pounds of food do the primates consume each week? Ooh, excellent question. I don't have an exact number, um, but we we get a produce delivery twice a week 
to keep up with the demand. Um, and our produce delivery is usually um, like a couple cases of romaine lettuce, a couple cases of cucumbers and zucchini, um, a case of you know apples and pears. Um, we go through a couple boxes of bananas. Um, and so I don't have the exact pounds, but we go through a lot of fruits and vegetables. That's a good question. I'm gonna have to look into that. Cool. Um, we don't seem to have any more questions currently in the chat. If anyone has a few more, drop them in now. Uh, Southwick Zoo has reopened and we are offering tickets. Um, I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about what the zoo, the zoo being open for walkthroughs looks like right now, Samantha. Sure, of course. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, we uh, just reopened for the season as a walkthrough um, on Monday. Uh, so we're excited to be reopening for the season. Um, we are um, following state guidelines and restrictions. So um, we still have a mask policy in effect. So while you're here, you still have to wear a mask. Um, we are still doing timed ticketing. So you do need to reserve your tickets ahead of time online. Um, all of this information and the reservations are on our website. So southwickszoo.com. Um, but, you know, all of our animals are out. Um, our education building is still closed, but um, we don't have very many indoor buildings to begin with. So um, that is the good thing we can still pretty much you can still see everything that's out on exhibit because it's outside. And so we can meet those um, COVID requirements there and you can enjoy them in a safe way. Um, we are also still offering a drive through experience um, this year. Uh, we're still working on the details. It was Monday and Wednesday evenings. I think we're going to be switching to Mondays and Tuesdays. Um, but of course, that information will be posted on our website as well. So that offers guests another way to see the zoo um, from the comfort of their car in a safe environment, um, which is a, a, a new thing we were able to offer last year um, with the COVID restrictions. Yeah, if anyone uh, would like a discount to that drive through, go ahead and email mytac-office at mit.edu and we'll send that to you so you can enjoy the experience. Um, one person, uh, just Barbara, just dropped in another question into the chat. Uh, does the bright coloration, blues and other colors on some of the species have adaptive significance evolutionarily? How, how did those develop? Any theories? Yeah, good question. Um, our best guess, and by our, I mean <laughs> researchers and scientists, um, so um, the best guess that they have is that it's uh, really just for sexual dimorphism mating preferences. So um, it doesn't have any adaptive value for the individual itself other than um, finding a mate. So it's um, especially like in the mandrel species, the males that are more brightly colored. Um, so it's believed that the brighter coloration is indicative of a healthier male. And so that's going to attract um, females and allow that male to mate and pass on its genes. Um, the coloration in the other Gwenins, um, a lot of the other monkeys that we saw, the Debrazas and Schmitz, um, they don't have much difference between the sexes, um, but between the species, there's a lot of different uh, hair and fur coloration patterns. Um, and the, that is believed um, was developed just to kind of um, tell the different populations apart. But um, otherwise we can't, we, there hasn't been any good theories that I'm aware of um, to any other adaptive advantages, but that's a really good question. Cool, thanks. Um, it is past five. So if anyone needs to go, we are putting this up on YouTube. Samantha, do you have time for one more question? Um, yeah, I can fit one more in, sure. Great, what do you do to winterize for the primates? Good question. Um, so we actually move a lot of those smaller lemurs and monkeys inside. We have heated buildings on site. Um, so they get moved indoors for the winters to keep them nice and toasty. Our chimpanzees um, have a heated house that's attached to their enclosure um, that we also bring them in each night just for safety as well. So we don't have to move those guys anywhere. Um, the smaller individuals, we do just move into a heated area for the winter. But good question. We do have to, um, they, they adapt fairly well to the New England weather, but still not adapted for snow. So we do need to bring them inside. Cool. And a, a follow up to that question, where do you put the animals when it rains? 
Good question. So um, it rains outside as well in their natural habitat. So um, it's not like they're, you know, can't be out in the rain. Um, when it rains or we know there's going to be bad weather, we do give them um, the option to be inside. So they usually have um, night houses attached to their enclosures. We also offer, you know, shelter um, areas in their enclosures as well. Um, so it's really up to them whether they want to be sitting out in the rain or they can be covered. Um, but it's not a problem for them to be out in the weather. That's something they would encounter out in the wild as well. Um, so it's something we let them deal with here as, as well as. Awesome. Uh, thank you so much. We don't seem to have any more questions from the chat. This was a fantastic talk, as always as it is, whenever we get to have you. Thank you so much. My pleasure.